Thank you very much for that very kind introduction and thank you for coming out this evening here um, at the Royal Institute. I'm extremely fortunate and privileged to have come for the Friday Forum on the backs of some very stellar uh, speakers who are also great thought leaders. I can't pretend to be a thought leader, but I will say this, that sometimes you have to be on the ground. And so the perspective I want to really give to you is one of somebody who has traveled to every part of South Asia. In fact, uh, I feel privileged that I have actually been able to visit every part of South Asia over the course of my career. And speak about what prospects we can have, particularly given the upcoming South Summit, and particularly given the obvious challenges that we seem to face every time we head into a South Summit. You know, the other reason I'm particularly happy to be here is to speak in a country like Bhutan because you are an audience from a nation that has, if you like, written the book on thinking out of the box, written the book on alternate solutions to some of the problems the world is still grappling with. The concept of looking for national happiness as opposed to a domestic product. Uh, I think that's a, that's that reveals itself as serious out of the box thinking. When the world was depleting coal reserves everywhere, Bhutan was looking to its rivers for power. I would, in fact, always tell friends of mine that you can't get more out of the box thinking when you realize that Bhutan actually had the internet before it had what we call the idiot box. So it was quite literally out of the box at the time. Now the subject for my speech, as you can see over here, is the prospects for the South Summit. But it's also the prospects for the South Summit beyond just India and Pakistan. As I said, I have had the privilege to cover South Asia for several years, but I've also had the privilege and the pain of covering every SARC summit, I think except for one, in the last 20 years. It's a privilege because as a, as a citizen of South Asia and as a journalist, I know very firsthand the potential of a grouping like SARC. And I really do believe in it. You know, if you take a look at some of those pictures, I've been to each, of, each one of these. Um, it's, you know, it's a similar picture in each time, leaders of the past, leaders of the present, and there is that similarity. But can you tell me what else is common between them? Uh, that, of course, was our mini summit, mini SARC summit earlier this year. But this is it. The headline I have always written, once before every SARC, is India-Pakistan tensions will dominate this SARC summit. I mean, it's been without exception. You know, I've, I pulled out one picture, as you can see, his Majesty is uh, there as well. Um, uh, it's, it has been the story of practically every SARC summit that we have covered. And that's why I said that it is also the pain of covering each of these SARC summits. Because you know that the slow progress that is made every time has to be consolidated. And instead, what we sometimes see, unfortunately, is the petty bickering of nations and leaders of stature. I, I was in Thimpu in 2010. I don't know how many of you were there at the time. But I sat in your, um, in your majestic uh, uh, parliament house and I listened to speeches from the leaders there and I was stunned by what I heard. Because for the first time perhaps it was articulated right at the podium, right at the stage of the South Summit, where I heard your Prime Minister, Prime Minister Jimmy Tindley, speak about how the tensions between India and Pakistan impacted the whole South region. I heard the Maldivian former president, Mohammed Nasheed, do the same things. In fact, this is what they said. Fractious and quarrelsome neighbors do not make a prosperous community. And I hope that neighbors can find ways to compartmentalize pending differences. You know, this is language you don't hear from heads of state normally. You don't hear countries actually castigating other countries right on the stage. And I realized at the time that in a sense, there must be a real deep feeling inside all of South Asia that you know what, you have to stop this because you're keeping us all back. And as a, and as a citizen of India, I have to say, I really do hope we don't let you down in the coming South. But I have a lot of optimism from the upcoming South Summit and I will tell you why. Um, to begin with, I think one of the reasons we should all have a lot of hope is each of the leaders who are coming to the South Summit come 
with very strong mandates and with, a, with maybe a few exceptions, you know, expect to have a very long few years ahead of them where they can take whatever decisions are made forward. The second is it's coming on the back of what we have called a mini SARC summit in May in Delhi where Prime Minister Modi had invited all the leaders. Uh, it wasn't Prime Minister Modi when he invited them, but he was when they were there in Delhi. And uh, I think the, the sort of platform that that served was to tell people that yes, we do have our differences, but we're going to try and make a go of it. Having said that, 14 years later, we're still dealing with the same questions that were made in right at the beginning, uh, were made in 2001 um, and in Nepal, if you remember the last time we had the SARC summit in Nepal. And 30 years after the SARC was formed, the eight countries that form nearly a quarter of the world population contribute just 3% to the world's GDP are still bound by very much the same kind of rhetoric. SARC, in fact, is the least integrated regional bloc of the world. That's certainly a very dubious honor to have. And many of you in the audience will look at me and say, that's not very true. Look at India and Bhutan. Uh, the ease with which we integrate with each other, the ease with which we travel, the currencies. But the truth is that Bhutan and India are a template for South Asia. They are the best case scenario, and we know that that's not the case of the rest of South Asia. You know, I speak to students around India, so forgive me when I ask you to do this, but I do want to ask the audience here, how many of you have traveled outside Bhutan? But just to show you. Okay, most, most of you would have traveled outside Bhutan. How many of you would have traveled to more than two other South countries? Okay, it's getting fewer and fewer. How many of you would have traveled to all eight South countries? Okay, I think there's just the three of us in this audience. The reason I make that point is, is, is there not something wrong with it? That here we are in a region that's clearly bounded by nature. I mean, if you look at a geographical map, if you look at the relief features of the map, South Asia is one whole. Even Maldives actually fits in, in a sense. Um, but even so, so many of us have gone through lives without seeing each of the countries right next to us. If I was to ask how many in, in some audiences, how many have been to Bangkok, how many have been to Singapore, how many have been to Dubai, you'll find more hands go up than for people who have been outside the South Asian region. I don't, I don't want to weigh you down with figures, but I want you to take a serious look at what this has meant, this lack of integration within South Asia. So I'm going to give you uh, some of the hard figures, and I'll tell you why they're important to begin with. These are just export figures, but it's intra-regional trade of various blocks around the world. So if you look at the EU, which is quite obvious, and I've only got data up to 2006 here, forgive me, but it hasn't gotten much better, unfortunately. 66%, two-thirds of the EU's trade is done within the European Union itself. NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, 53%. You have ASEAN, which is significantly lower, you have IOR, which is significantly higher, but the lowest in that entire one is that number there in red. And that's 5.6%. 5.6%, sometimes less, is the amount of intra-regional trade in the South region. Take a look at this then. If you look, uh, I mean, all those figures look very impressive, but it's really the last line we need to look at. If you look at that last line as of 2008, with the exception of Bhutan, because of course Bhutan has so much trade uh, with India, and Nepal, and those figures have considerably decreased since then, the three biggest economies of the South region, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, all hovered around 5%. 5% of their trade is actually done in South Asia. So where do you expect South Asian trade to increase from here? India is one of the worst offenders, as I said. So if you look at both the export and import figures at the trade figures here, there's not much change in a decade. And in fact, if you, if you look at the import figures, they're lower. That's Actually, in black and white, the kind of figures we're looking at when you talk about integration in the South region. As a result, these are figures that, that define us in a sense in the world rankings when it comes to ease of doing business, 
when it comes to political instability, when it comes to how tough it is to start a business in these regions, we're not ranking far up there. In a sense, we all know why. It's because the two largest countries of this region are holding us back with their internal, with, with their bilateral differences. To me, ladies and gentlemen, SAC is simply common sense. You know, you have to just ask a teacher, you ask a lawyer, you ask uh, a businessman, and they will tell you it's just common sense. If you're looking for a market, what's better? One million or 1.6 billion? If you want to lead the world in R&D, research and development, is it better to choose from a pool of five million engineers or eight million engineers? You know, I'm always amazed by the fact that we have all these differences and here if you, if you watch our television and if you speak to people, you would think we're so far apart. And then you'll go abroad you go and study in England or the US or Singapore and your roommates and your best friends will always be from South Asia. The people that you, uh, that you share the same humor with are always from the region. If you want, for example, to use a river, if you were to talk about the environment, if you want to use a river for your population, ask any expert. Is it easier to cut it up and use it as upstream, downstream, midstream? Or does it make sense to try and jointly manage the free run of the river from the glaciers to the sea? And if you want to battle climate change or work on the environment, is it better if you have control of the ecology as a whole or only some geography book with lines on a map? I agree, mean, Sark is a unit because Mother Nature willed it. And yet, we don't have a South Asian free trade agreement working on the ground because Pakistan will not go the extra mile, the last mile, to sign it. We don't have visa-free travel in the region because India is, and many would say justifiably so, worried about terrorism. With the exception of Bhutan, and not really Nepal, we each of us have more trade with China than we do with the other South countries combined. We have a South Asian university that's made some progress, but it remains a showpiece. 250 students, of which half are Indian at present. But most importantly, we have no roads that connect us right across. We have no direct flights between our capitals. And we don't have many trains that go across either. A few maybe have been, have been start, restarted now. We don't have telecompatibility. Most of you who have traveled in the region will know this. As an Indian, my phone doesn't work, for example, in Pakistan. And it costs four to five times to go roaming in the region than in any other part of the world. So while SAAF makes complete common sense, what we have on the ground makes no sense at all. We then have to work towards what is the solution. How do we move beyond this? If we say, if we agree that the root of all our problems is in a sense the, the, the fact that the two biggest SAAF economies, the two biggest SAAF countries, still have many disputes that have evaded solutions for 67 years, the solution to that is going to require thinking out of the box, which is why I'm particularly happy to be here. If you look at conflict resolution theory, one would say there are really two options to it. Option one, uh, uh, I, should, I should add over here, in fact, these are some of the reasons why I feel so strongly that the India-Pakistan um, relationship has in fact held back ties. One, the low, the low trade between the two biggest countries affects all intra-trade in South. Supply routes have been affected for far too long. We can't trade with Afghanistan even though we know that there's so much that we could possibly do properly because supply routes don't allow easy access. FDI to the whole region is always affected by tensions. And the degradation of infrastructure at the border crossings is another reason why we are, we, we are in fact failing ourselves. So if we were to look really at the kind of solutions we want, one option, as I said, would be to try and tackle, let me go to the next one here, tackle problems head on. This is a solution many conflict resolution theorists would speak about. How do we do that? To begin with, India would really have to commit to a conflict resolution mechanism. It would have to say, okay, our conflicts can be brought up at the SARC. Forum. I don't think this is a very easy possibility and skeptics will say when you have bilateral problems you have to solve them bilaterally. But I think if that hasn't worked in 70 years, maybe changing the angle sometimes helps. You know, um, yesterday 
I had the privilege of interviewing Prime Minister Shirin Tobge, and he said something very wisely when I said to him that you know these differences tend to crop up and SARC summits tend to get overshunned by them. He said, but look at it the other way. If there wasn't a SARC platform, if there wasn't a forum at which they had to meet, perhaps many differences would not have actually been solved. He referred, of course, to the Nepal summit, to the Bhutan summit, when India and Pakistan's leaders went into it, not quite sure they would meet. But eventually, because they met, tensions actually subsided. So what we are looking at it would be to have some kind of conflict resolution mechanism within SARC itself. The next part, as I say, is that Pakistan, in a sense, since it has become the epicenter of so many terror groups, will have to confront its double speak when you say terrorism. I'll go back to that map that I have over here. I call it the triangle of terror. If you look at Pakistan over there, there are three types of groups. To the north, in the Kashmir area, there's the lashkar e toiba the jesh e mohammed the hezbollah Mujahid. Many, many of them now operate south as well. But they're out there. There's the Punjabi Taliban to the south, if you like, or certainly to the, uh, to the, uh, to the west in, there in Punjab. And then if you go right to the west of Pakistan, there's the tehrik -e taliban the TTPJA, the Jindullah, and other groups that operate over there. They work in a triangle. Can they work together? In fact, they do. You know, when the Marriott bombings happen, what seemed to emerge from all of the investigations was one part of the, uh, uh, the bomb making came from one group, from up there. One part of the training came from another part. One part of the execution and logistics came from a third group. More and more terror groups around the world are coming together. A group like Al-Qaeda, for example, is always a threat not just to Pakistan or to India or in fact to the whole region, because they work on the idea that they will be able to unite on the basis of, of their ideology. If we have to defeat them, we have to defeat them on the basis of our ideology, which is a united South Asia. That, according to me, is really the only way forward and perhaps a South mechanism on terror, <coughs> which has been discussed in the past as well, is one solution. <coughs> Tied into this is, of course, the security question. Why is it that all, all groupings, all uh, uh, the various groupings around the world that we have seen actually are able to look at the security of that entire region together. Why is it that we are fighting each other, but in fact we are not able to stand up for each other's security? That's another tough option if you are going to go by option one and say take our troubles head on that we can think about. Afghanistan, for example, is heading into a period of uncertainty and no one really knows how it will turn out. I think we have to, have to see that regional security eventually is not just a factor of South Asian unity, it's a factor really of South, Asian, of South Asia's future. Next, there is the other tough question. I know it's been asked again and again. Every time one of India's neighbors or one of the South countries has some kind of a tie-up with China, that question does get asked. Is China the big elephant in the room when it comes to the South region? And the truth is we have to turn it on its head. We have to understand that each of our countries have relations with, of course, uh, the exception of Bhutan, with China. India itself has China as its biggest trading partner. So the expectation, really, that it will not be a factor in this region uh, is, is, is a little optimistic. But if we were to turn it on its head and say, can SARC deal with China as a whole, as we have had India dealing with other um, groupings in East Asia, that perhaps might do away with a lot of the insecurities many people here feel. And finally, there is the question of how long we can continue to speak about ourselves as nuclear powers, talk about nuclear deterrence, but not about the harnessing of that nuclear energy. I know it's still controversial about whether this nuclear energy is the only way forward when it comes to energy. But already we've seen talks between India and Sri Lanka, talks between India and Bangladesh when it comes to sharing some kind of nuclear power technology uh, and in these energy starved regions maybe in the short term the best option. Okay, I, I can see from the faces around me that each of the options I spoke about there are very tough to do, they're hard to do. So are there easier options? And that's when you come to the next solution. Do the doable solutions first.
try and talk about the things where there is little controversy, the tourism, the climate change, education. In fact, in, in this particular SARC in Nepal, we are hopeful of the signing of three very important agreements on energy cooperation, on railways and the motor vehicles agreement. Each of these have uh, uh, an immense power if they are in fact passed and implemented during this SARC summit. Um, but there are lots more and this is again where out of the box thinking is going to be what is required. What we haven't done in 30 years of SARC, we need to start revisiting again. To begin with, we haven't completely harnessed what they call best practices in the region for everybody else. You know, you can show me something in Europe, in the Scandinavian countries, you can show me a project that's worked in Southeast Asia, but I know that the project that works in a country in South Asia, in the South region, is in fact the project that will work all, all across the region. I'll give you a small example. You know, earlier this year, I covered a, a school in Uttar Pradesh. Now, the person who started the school had come back from an education abroad. And he had decided that he wanted to ensure that there was education for every girl in his village, at which point when he came back, there was practically about 10%. Now in India, there are stark figures, but they're figures that can be uh, replicated across South Asia uh, and not Bhutan, of course. When they start out in school, 66 million girls go to primary school in India. By the time they reach that 18th year and graduate from school, that number is 22 million. Now a lot of that happens for different reasons. There's economic necessity, there's puberty that causes parents to worry about their children not allowing them out. There's a problem of hygiene for many, there's a problem of safety in traveling to schools. So here's what this experiment, this, uh, this gentleman worked out as an experiment. He went to each family in that village and said, for every day that your daughter goes to school, I will give you 10 rupees. And she has to, of course, get us a basic amount of attendance, in which case I'll pay, pay that money every year, according to how many days she goes to school. But he didn't stop there. Because, of course, incentivizing is itself a controversial option. But he went a step ahead. He said, if she is able to get a certain amount of attendance and a certain grade, so if she gets a first grade, then I will give her a bicycle, which does away with the safety option, makes it easier to, for her to come to school. If she goes a few more years and has still got a good attendance, I will ensure that one female member of her family can come to the school for vocational training. So now you're getting in, into employment and jobs and skilling of those families. Finally, if she turns 18 and graduates from the school, I will build a toilet inside her home. Now, you might wonder about the feasibility of something like this. If eventually, it costs, if the incentives were just looked at on their own, it costs 3,650 if, if, um, if she was to go maybe 100 days to school, which was the basic minimum there. The fact was, it wasn't about the money he was able to get 100% attendance from all the girls of that village as a result of, of this particular incentivization. But what was also interesting is as they got out of that school, these girls were now getting into white collar jobs. They were getting jobs as receptionists, working in outsourcing. Whereas the boys of that, those villages were, were not in fact finding the same kind of uh, work because they hadn't had that incentivized education, so they didn't do as well when they got out. Uh, and as a result, girls from the village now no longer wanted to marry boys from the village. Now this is a problem that we understand in South Asia, which makes sense completely to all of us. And I think these are the kind of best practices that we have to find a way in health and in education uh, for us to be able to share. You come to the problem of labor standards. You know, I'll just quote to you from a Human Rights Watch a uh, report that said, in Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan and Sri Lanka, remittances from migrants are larger than the national foreign exchange reserves of those countries. Remittances form 25% of Nepal's gross domestic product in 2012. In India, remittances are larger than the earnings from IT exports, from information technology exports. The World Bank estimates South Asian countries will receive 114 billion in remittances last year, 
48% of these would come from Gulf countries. But there's another side to that story, and it's a story we all hear every day. Um, bad labor standards, workers not being allowed any freedoms in the countries they go to, uh, depression, even suicide over the years. These are all stories we have heard of. If South countries were to get together and say, we want to enforce minimum labor standards, would they not be able to make that big a difference? Because right now what's happening is the South countries, which form the bulk of the labor in these countries, are actually ending up competing with each other. If I can't get my labor at these, uh, 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 if I can't get my labor these standards, this country will not send people, but another country will. They're in fact, even on wages, competing with each other. India is in fact, as we speak, raising the cost of remittances problem at the G20. But really the point is to add the power from the South as a whole. Other ideas, environment, climate change, it's an important place where the South countries can work together. And of course, the, the really sad part is that where we see the most, you know, the most vulnerable places uh, in South Asia when it comes to global warming, those are also conflict fault lines. So the Siachen Glacier is one of those. The Sundarbans Delta is really walks along a, a conflict fault line. We've seen what's happened in the degradation of the barrier reef between India and Sri Lanka, the degradation of fish populations there. Uh, and of course, the Maldives has an ongoing problem. The interesting part is that actually it is this region that knows the most when it comes to renewables. Bhutan, I don't need to say. You know, the fact that you are able to get energy at such low cost is because of the vision of your leadership in talking about hydropower much earlier. Uh, many of you may not know, but in India, solar power was something we spoke about in the 1980s, but we allowed others to get the better off. In fact, in the Renewables Index, India does not lag far behind. We're the fourth in the world when it comes to the Renewable Index. But we need to find out how to make that substantial investment in this region. Why are we talking about deals you know, outside of the region when all the expertise really in renewable energy, and particularly because in this region we have learned to live much simpler than Western or industrialized countries have. And we must be able to tap that. India has as much to learn as to impart to the South region, whether it's about coastal zone management from the Maldives, forestry management from Bhutan, a country whose constitution mandates 60% forest cover, and actually manages much more than that. On the other hand, Afghanistan could benefit from the Indian experience of managing the degradation that's caused by mining and the plunder of mineral resources that is bound to follow if they in fact have the kind of peace that we hope they do. Sri Lanka in fact has an estimated power, wind power, because it's an island and uh, it's surrounded by these oceans, it has estimated wind power of 20,000 megawatts. For us to be able to harness this in South Asia would mean that we would not look to the rest of the world over time for our energy needs. There is the digital dividend, which we don't need to say anything about. Our children, I think, are showing us the way in the way they are engaged with the world, in the way that they know what is happening. Um, I see in my children's generation, uh, students who have gone to Pakistan, students who are in, in touch with people in Bhutan or in Bangladesh, simply because they are part of a school project or are able to do this over the internet, something perhaps my generation didn't have uh, quite the benefit of. But there's a huge digital dividend. You know, the fact is that it knows really no language barrier when it comes to computer technology. Uh, I, I don't know if any of you have heard of the hole-in-wall experiment, but years ago this was an experiment done in NIIT in Delhi, um, where, uh, where the professor who set up the experiment just put a hole in a wall. On one side he put a computer, on the other side he put a keyboard. And he just watched. The other side of that wall had a slum with some very poor children who had never been to school. And he found that over a period of a month, they were able to use the keyboard, they were able to use the mouse, they were able to paint pictures on the computer. All of this then increased and increased, and I, I won't go into the whole story, you can look it up. But eventually he has moved to 100 projects in I think at least 80 countries. Uh, he's been able in fact to, uh, to add 
to all of that language. Where you found in one village, for example, where the children had never spoken English, they were able to learn English in about two years of just following the computer that was set up in their village. These are little experiments, ladies and gentlemen, that all of us in South Asia can learn from and, and can use. There is the, fi the, the final frontier, as they call it, space. Uh, and Prime Minister Modi has already spoken of what they call a SARC satellite uh, you know, <coughs> technology that can benefit the entire SARC region. I think yesterday he's even said Myanmar can be a part of that SARC satellite. It's certainly a very exciting um, idea. And I can tell you when he first announced it, most people were rolling their eyes. But it's, it's the power of that idea. And I don't think it's something we, we should, uh, we should uh, reject as impossible if I was to say that one day maybe an eight-man manned mission into space would have one person from every country of SARC. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, and this comes back to that question I asked all of you about whether you have traveled in the SARC region. I think we have to now work very seriously, this is not just a project, very seriously on pushing tourism within our region. Our children, our college students must be encouraged to learn more about the neighbors that they live amongst. Um, we've had different ways of trying to push this that haven't worked so far. Get people to people ties, have journalists come together. I think the obvious thing is to now look to the next generation and ensure that when I stand in front of an audience, maybe 20 years from now, everyone will put up their hands and say, I have been to every region of South Asia. A journey of a thousand miles, I think, as they say, begins with one step, and the journey to South Asian unity, I definitely believe, can be ensured by each of its citizens making that one step over a border. Of course, you can't do it with Sri Lanka and Maldives, but you, you get the power of the idea. The truth is, my friends, to fight the idea of Saak is, in fact, to fight geography and history and Mother Nature in the region. The obvious thing that I always say is the sum of our parts is greater than the whole. And we have a voice far stronger if we are able to speak as one. Thanks so much for listening to me. Normally I'm not used to this because as a journalist I'm sitting over there and there's never a problem with questions. I see one gentleman putting their hand up at the back. We'll just wait till we get a mic too. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful talk on SAC. But uh, I represent no particular group or uh, anybody. I'm an indi private individual by myself. And uh, what I would like to first say is that SARC beyond India and Pakistan. And this uh, group has been uh, sort of literally crawling at a uh, snail's uh, space. And beyond Pakistan and India, that crawling becomes even slower for the SAC as a whole. So I would like to nominate you, request you to represent the, a group of uh, people's initiative for the improvement of the region. Because when, when people talk, when political leaders, elected leaders talk, they talk what the government wants. Not as individual, but not as what I want. So it is just skim over the top, and the people in the villages, in the valleys, on the mountainside, they never get to hear or see the daylight of the such activities as such. And then in the, I have uh, uh, glanced through the doable options. One is significantly missing from there is the people's to people interaction. If, if SAD could promote 
leave the political, uh, politicians aside, the bureaucracies aside, but a movement where I can go to Pakistan and spend a couple of days in a remote village and vice versa throughout the South region. So that we come to know as people who are working, who are trying every day to take out a living out of it. And as individual citizens, we have no business in what the, the natives are uh, thinking uh, uh, with the bigger picture in mind. So maybe if this sun could shift a little focus to all the political differences and the uh, boundaries and issues and trade and space and everything else for the till the next summit, if this focus is changed to this, I think it will make a world of difference and probably then these people can make a difference voice from their small um, you know, units and then all other uh, things that can follow. Otherwise, the people in the hamlets, in the villages, remote areas, they get left out and, uh, and they are very ill-informed. So if this is thing like it, a, a point of time will come where this guy says, hey guys, the because, and then when, when the intellectuals and the, the uh, elected leaders visit all these uh, areas, it's a different. They never know what's happening in the back streets, in the gullies, and in the villages. So my request is if you could represent the people's initiative towards improving such relations. With these thoughts, I think in the coming years, it might make a slight changes from the normal mundane, you know, the terrorism and the um, uh, all other things that uh, sort of create some um, uh, unnatural sort of boundaries. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir. In fact, uh, we should have the applause for you, really, um, because you've come up with. base of it, which is that if, if every citizen of this region is able to go to the other side, of whichever boundary border it is, they immediately are, they, they have to shed all their preconceived notions aside. Uh, and and uh, uh, it's exactly the people to people ties that will eventually drive us all ahead. I think what we saw in Europe in a sense, not that we can recreate what the European Union did or that we want the challenges that they deal with. Um, but what they were able to do was just make it easier for the citizen and then everything else uh, flowed from there in a sense. You know, I, I have this story because, of course, I know that I'm in a special position as a journalist because I actually have a reason and the access to go to other countries. Now, one of the, uh, one of the projects I work on is uh, what they call track to diplomacy. The idea that civil society, uh, former officials, journalists, uh, lawyers can meet uh, from both countries that are in conflict, in this particular case, India and Pakistan, and uh, speak about solutions which don't necessarily have to be taken up by the government straight away. <coughs> but over time, they, they find their way into the public narrative. Now, on this particular trip, I was, uh, I was traveling along with a former intelligence chief of India. I won't name him. But uh, what was interesting for me was I was on that trip for when he was going over to the other side for the first time in his life. Now he was a retired, uh, in the retired intelligence chief. So he had gone through his entire life of 60 years without once traveling to this country that he probably focused most of his work on. Uh, I think, you know, uh, the bulk of what he was doing uh, dealt with the other country. So we crossed over and uh, I started to look around for him because our luggage had been put and I couldn't find him. And then I finally found him in one corner with tears in his eyes. And I said to him, is everything okay? What happened? Are you feeling all right? Are you tired? And he said, no, you know, but it's exactly the same as across the border. And I just, I found it, it you know, illuminating that this person who had gone through his entire life studying the other country was stunned by the idea that there wasn't so much of a difference just across the border. He went on, you know, he said they speak the same language as me. Uh, they look just like us and I really wanted to say to him, you know, you should know this by now. 
but you don't. And the truth is that if, if somebody in his position didn't, uh, what chance does the ordinary citizen of any country have? Eventually we judge the other country really through the prism of those who want to guide us, whether it's the media, whether it's our politicians. Um, and those are the people who end up making up our minds for us. And it really should not be like that. You know, in, in another small example, for years, Indian cinema has now been allowed in Pakistan. So I found when I went to Pakistan, people had a new understanding of what was happening inside India because, you know, Bollywood films, of course. And uh, it used to be funny because I'd open the newspaper there and it would say something like, Karina takes ill. And I'd be uh, wanting to say, well, you know, she's our actress. But they are sort of enter just as easily as it, it happens in, in different parts of the region. Uh, and then about a year ago, uh, they started a channel in India that shows only Pakistani television serials. And suddenly, I found the people who were the most antagonistic towards the other country were coming up to me and saying, ma'am, you've seen this place. Is it really like this? Is it really like what they're showing on television? Because it looks exactly like us. And, you know, the, the, the questions that have come, I, I should add over here that of all the general entertainment channels, uh, this is the channel that now has some of the highest uh, ratings. So, it, it's a myth that in fact the people of the two countries are antagonistic because the moment they get a chance, the moment you get a window to the other side, you are able to, to make a connection immediately. So thank you for that question. Uh, I, uh, I, I would like to nominate you really for any sort of a people's initiative uh, uh, rather. But it's a very important point and thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm also a journalist, and it's not very often that a journalist asks a uh, journalist question in this kind of forum, but uh, it's very interesting to listen to your talk, and especially the, with the upcoming South Summit, it's a very appropriate topic with all Pakistan and India. I had the opportunity to opportunity to cover one of the South Summits in Islamabad. And then to reach Islamabad, first we had to travel to Thailand and Bangkok, and then to Pakistan. So when we came back, we had to fly first to Dubai, and so that is the connectivity part, uh, in addition to the connectivity, uh, connectivity part you talked about. The, the, my question is, uh, you know, I, <clears throat> I have felt that all the South Summit is others dominated by the conflict between Pakistan and India, and the, and the media tends to uh, fuel it. Because in, in Islamabad, I saw the the journalists literally climbing over the ministers and sometimes even trying to put words in, in their mouth. So that's why I feel that sometimes maybe it is the, the fault of the media uh, that is feeling the problem. And, and, and we rarely see that a lot of positive things are not covered by, uh, by any of the media, including, including maybe my people. Also. So the question is, is what is the role of media in, in making SAP? Uh, a very fruitful body. And the other question is uh, about the expectations uh, from the upcoming Saksan in Nepal. Uh, besides the agreements that line up between, uh, to be signed between India and Nepal, uh, what, what are the expectations? What can we expect from this Saksan? Especially we have a, you know, a new prime minister uh, in India who, who is known to be a, a person who walks the talk. So I, I am feeling that there's a lot of expectations from this last time, and you also mentioned that, so it would be interesting to know what all the eight countries can expect from this summit. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your question, and it's not often that I have to answer questions uh, from a journalist either. Um, to answer your second question first, the expectations from this song, I think there's no question uh, that to begin with, the leadership is a much stronger leadership all around. Um, and we are expecting uh, that they will be able to take strong decisions if they are willing to. And the most important thing is always political will to take it forward. Um, but as I said, the, the mini SARC we saw in May this year has really, if you like, charged up the idea of the South Asian region. And, uh, and I think Prime Minister Modi must be credited also 
with going that extra mile to come here to Bhutan, go to Nepal as well, um, to, to engage with the subcontinent as much as possible. You know, even when we went to, when he went to New York, uh, he met with the South Asian leadership. Uh, so hopefully this will be a step forward. What we don't know, which is always the wild card in there, is what the India-Pakistan equation will do to the rest of it. But what are the possibilities? To begin with, as I said, there are these three agreements that uh, South nations will sign. They are by no means small agreements. The motor vehicles agreement to allow motor vehicles to go across, uh, I think will change the complexion of this travel route. Because what it does immediately is it creates new opportunities for business. And once you have businessmen involved, you have new stakeholders involved in the process. Uh, the second part is the railways as well. And infrastructure is a crying need for the entire region. Uh, earlier this year, I had the privilege of uh, traveling to China and uh, then to Tibet to see the, the new rail line that has been built there. Now, I was with the South Asian group of journalists. And what was interesting was all of us were looking at the same thing and saying, why should it not be possible? for us to be able to build something like this in the South Asian region, connect us all up uh, with the railways. And the third one is an agreement on energy cooperation, which is, which is really overdue. Uh, so I do think that there are concrete expectations from this uh, particular summit. I think there's also the, the fear underlying that, that it could get derailed if uh, bilateral relations, are, you know, the tensions show up. But I have a feeling that the leaders that we have seen, and um, I, I, I did ask Prime Minister uh, Tongke the, the same question. I said, do you worry uh, as Bhutan Prime Minister when, you, when you're going to the South Summit that you know, this will overtake? Uh, and he said, I have no worries because of what I saw between all the leaders in Delhi in May this year. Uh, so I think we should just remain optimistic. Uh, and hope that it will not be another because you know next year will actually be exactly 30 years since SARC started and it would be an extreme shame if we were to be just repeating ourselves and playing a script. When it comes to the role of the media, this is something I'm asked all the time because they say how can you speak like this when frankly it is the media that causes so much of the tensions between countries uh, and I think that the media's role is very important but eventually medias tend unfortunately to, uh, to follow the lines that they get from their establishments, from their governments. You will not find the media taking on the establishment quite as much. Uh, for example, when you actually have a bilateral meeting between leaders who have been in conflict, suddenly you will find the media switches around and we are talking about what food they ate or how many times they shook hands or where did the wives go. Or, you know, it, 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 it automatically turns over and you suddenly find the media you know, taking all of it in their stride. So I think the media tends to go with the news and goes with what they think the governments are planning. And, and when people are completely you know, despondent about this idea, I always say, uh, if you want to see what can change in relationships, uh, take a look at perhaps the relationship with Bangladesh that India had. You know, 10 years ago, I can remember, um, in fact, 20 years ago, it was not possible to do one of the SARC summits because of the bad relations between India and Bangladesh. But about 10 years ago, if you had asked, most people would have related <coughs> in India, would have related in Bangladesh to uh, perhaps you know, anti Indian feelings. And uh, it wasn't, in a sense, the most popular country there was. Of course, Bhutan remains, one, uh, remains the most popular country in that sense. Of, uh, India ties, but um, we did a we did a survey a few years ago, and we found that really Bangladesh had suddenly turned from being one of the least trusted to one of the most trusted uh, countries in the region. And a similar survey in Bangladesh found the same with people talking about India. What caused that change? To begin with, I think uh, the new government that had come in in 2007 really made it their mission to better ties between the two countries. Uh, the second part was a real crackdown on terrorism that eventually worked on both sides of the border. But the actual fact was that governments decided that they must put their differences behind them and work together. Uh, and uh, the, the difference has been amazing. The change in the, uh, in the bilateral trade between the two countries, the new travel links between the two countries. Uh, many in India are now thinking about using Bangladesh as a transit route as well uh, and talking about the idea of not just sharing energy with them 
But having that power then sent on to India's northeast uh, and make a difference in the in the lives over there. So I think the, 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 the fact is that it's very easy for us to get despondent about the future of South Asia and the, and the, and the possibility, if you like, of changing these conflicted relationships. But on the ground, we've seen them work. And I think what you have to go on to is the success stories uh, and realize that what is possible and is doable is what we all should aim for. Thank you. We agree with you that there is uh, there is so much potential uh, for the countries in the region to get together to bring benefit to the peoples in our region. However, uh, we realize that uh, the potentials have not been uh, explored as much as we could have done because of uh, his lack of political will. And that lack of political will, I believe, has come about because of history and the differences in uh, perception by the different countries. However, uh, I, my own view is that India as the largest uh, country uh, among the sub countries uh, should take the leadership role and uh, together with India, the other larger countries should also try their best to uh, do whatever they can to bring the countries closer together. Uh, it has been about 30 years plus years since SAP was formed. However, uh, the achievements have been not as much as we would have liked them to be. So in, uh, so in my view, I feel that uh, it is difficult for the leaderships to, uh, because they have so many other considerations to uh, take into consideration. So it is uh, the media academics, intellectuals, who must uh, impress upon their government uh, and, and also the people that they want to have closer relations. And so if they keep on uh, pressing upon their governments, the governments will surely uh, uh, give, uh, uh, give way to what the people want. Now, uh, uh, regards the expectations for the uh, Asian sub summit, uh, I think we all have uh, much expectation, but uh, and uh, there is a small positive sign because uh, uh, when the new uh, Prime Minister of India at his swearing in, uh, he invited all the sub leaders. And uh, but of course uh, the media uh, many times we've uh, though we've heard that uh, the media they have said that in New York during the UN General Assembly they were not able to meet. But actually, uh, it's, uh, the facts are not completely correct because I, what I have read about is that uh, the flight of Mr. Bodhi was in the evening and in the afternoon and, and Pakistan president was coming in the evening. So there was just no time at all for them to meet. So I think the Sakh Savage in Kathmandu provides a very good uh, opportunity like uh, uh, in 2002, after the Kargil War, and then when there was attack on the Indian Parliament, after that, in Kathmandu again, uh, President Musharraf was able to meet, uh, uh, I think, Prime Minister Vajpayee. So then, then after that, the ice was broken, you know. So they had a chance to interact and to restart the Foreign Secretary's uh, talks. So we hope that. Uh, in a similar way, in Kathmandu, they will be able to have uh, some interaction 
which can start off uh, some talks. And of course, if the two big countries in the South, member countries in the South, can get together, then all of us, we would be very happy. All the uh, smaller countries like Bhutan, I mean, we will try in whichever way we can to contribute our bit to make SARC uh, as strong and as, uh, uh, as much as uh, it can benefit the peoples of the region. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. And I really do hope that the voices that we're hearing this evening are going out to our leadership, really, because they need to understand that it's not just uh, about governments. It's about the people of South Asia. It's about 1.6 billion people. And the aspirations of all of those people is to live in some kind of peace and uh, live conflict-free. So you're absolutely right. Uh, I think if leaders want to meet, they will meet. Uh, they will find a, a way to, to meet each other. Um, but I think what we must also remember is that really after, after the leadership has got that platform to stand on and to get together, uh, they are going to have to have that responsibility as well. You know, we put so much focus onto a meeting between two leaders that we tend not to realize that after that they have to go somewhere with it. Um, you know, I'll give you another example from my meeting with uh, uh, Prime Minister Tobe when uh, I, I met him in one of the rooms of, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, what is called Raven House in Thimpu. And I suddenly realized that in 2010, that was the very room and the very house in which Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and Prime Minister Gilani had shook hands and they'd then come out after their talks to me. And we had gone from you know, real despondency to complete enthusiasm. I, I, and I think that's something people must realize, that when leaders talk and actually have a, a good constructive meeting between them, that it exhilarates people in, in uh, the subconscious. I agree with you that the media plays a negative role, but the media equally represents that very positive kind of enthusiasm when they think that a solution, that some kind of uh, a conflict resolution, if you like, process or a mechanism is getting underway. So I do hope these voices do go out to the leaders uh, at uh, the Kathmandu SARC in particular because we don't want a situation where the two big countries of this region are essentially told, I'm sorry, but you've really let the rest of us down. I mean, I think we owe not just the people, we owe the next generation of our people much more than that. But thank you for your thoughts, ma'am, and I, I, I really do hope that that voice is going out uh, to our leadership as well. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Hyder. I think you have provided us a very, very clear insight into the kind of uh, situation we have itself and with uh, the Indo-Pakistan relations. By the way, my name is Pema Jamso. I am the leader of the opposition. Now, I just want to come to a very pointed question. Now, if we talk about trade, if you want to increase trade among our member countries, I think the issue in front would also be a discussion on a common currency for some countries. I would like to ask your assessment of such a proposal, whether it is going to feature in your list of doable things or list of undoable things. And that we should not even think about such a thing. Because if you want to increase trade between the countries, then I think that would be one, that would be a start at least. Now, in any relations, be it between people or between countries, I think it is a question of give and take. Perhaps it is time for India and Pakistan to list the number of gifts from each country to the other and the number of gifts. What can they give in? What can they take? Unless they start with that, I think we are going to be sad for me, sounds more like South Asian Association for Regional Conversation. We have done enough talking, but we don't know when we are going to walk the talk. And that is something that is, uh, I think the leaders will need to seriously think about. Because it's been 30 years, as you said, but nothing much actually on the ground in terms of cooperation is happening. 
Now, as you said, in a different way perhaps, sub makes really good sense. Where do we find the common sense to pursue that good sense? Is something that we should seriously think about. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And, uh, and of course, I know that uh, it was your government that was uh, in power when the, when the Thimpu summit happened as well. Um, the truth is, when you speak about the South Asian unit, which was the, the original idea of a, a unified currency, is it possible to do? I think we in India and Bhutan know that it is possible to do. I mean, I, I give somebody 100 Indian rupees and I give them 100 bilshams and, you know, the, the deal is done. It's the same thing. Uh, physically, I don't think there is an issue. But uh, in terms of trade, uh, we can't shy away from the fact that the South Asian free trade agreement has really not been able to take off on the ground. Specifically, uh, Pakistan does have its worries about preferential trade, about trade barriers and non-tariff barriers that they are worried uh, India is, um, is still enforcing on them. The truth is though that Pakistan has in the past at a cabinet level cleared the idea of MFN status to India which would lead to the SAFTA as well. So it is doable. It's not that it isn't doable, but it will need that political will. Um, secondly, you know those figures that I showed over here were really export figures. I didn't even get into the import figures because we all have different needs perhaps. But when you look at export figures, there is really no real reason why in export we should be talking about exporting 5% of our produce in the region because it is, it's, as I said, it's the, it's the most common sensible thing that in the region you pay the less, least in terms of uh, trade, uh, in terms of the cost of uh, uh, moving goods to a place, the least amount in terms of uh, manpower that you need, the least in terms of, uh, of hiring people because it's much easier and it's much cheaper to hire people in our region itself. And it is amazing to me that even, you know, when you're speaking about exports, that you're not able to see that this is your big market that your best market is here. Money should really know no, um, uh, no country. It should, I mean, it should be, uh, it, sh it shouldn't get lost in translation in that sense. Um, and you should be able to uh, say that this is where my market is the easiest. This is where I'm able to build uh, much easier ties, payments, and all the rest of it. And the fact that we haven't done that, the fact that we're actually looking um, still to, uh, you know, to other countries in order to look for markets. We're looking to Southeast Asia. We're trying to send cars to West Asia. None of that is wrong. But there is something completely, um, I don't want to say nonsensical because that sounds rude, but a, a lack of common sense that we are not looking inside the region. Now the first part of that is going to have to be setting up better banking systems between us. And, and the truth is the whole South region is not integrated when it comes to banks, when it comes to remittances from uh, between these countries. Uh, and as I said, India and Bhutan is a template. If the South region wants to look at how you can uh, do things, maybe they should look to India and Bhutan. Um, do I think it's in the can-do list or the can't-do list? I think it's definitely a can-do, and I should add it to my uh, uh, PowerPoint. But I, I think that trade is one of those things that politicians tend to want to let go of last. And with, no, with, with all due respect to you as a politician as well, that politicians realize that if they allow trade out of their hands in a sense, everything else will be taken out of their hands. The pace of a relationship will just outstrip everything else when it comes to the economics of it. Uh, so one will hope that, that they are able to do it. You know, one, <coughs> one of the most, I'm sorry to keep coming back to just the India-Pakistan equation, but one of the most interesting conversations I sat in on was between the heads of two companies, one Indian company, one Pakistani company, and they both ran employment agencies. So India has Nokri.com and uh, Pakistan has Rosie.com. And it was amazing to me the kind of synergies they could work out if they got a job offer that they could not fill, uh, you know, for an outsourcing kind of contract, it would be so easy to pass it on to the other side because you have similarly <coughs> capable, similarly skilled people on the other side. Um, but the banking does get in the way. The, the government restrictions still get in the way. So if the governments were willing to step aside in a sense and allow uh, what we call stakeholders to be built, 
uh, I think you would see a change in the relationship because there's no question that businessmen as well, and since I have, I, I have uh, 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 spoken about the government's responsibilities and politicians' responsibilities, I will also speak about businessmen's responsibilities because we found in conflict that businessmen are the last to come in and the first to leave if there's trouble between uh, those two countries. So businessmen have to realize that they have to have long-term stakes in each other. Uh, there was a, a story I once had about, again, about India and Pakistan where uh, there was a large consignment of cement at a time when you know, India's construction boom had happened, India needed cement, and we had, uh, we had got some cement coming from Pakistan. Eventually, the ship came into the Bombay harbor, but because it had come from Pakistan, I'm talking about the year 2005, I think, when things were not so good, uh, it just stayed at the harbor and, and, and got moisture into it. Um, and the worry was that if the ship stayed in the harbor any longer, it would just become very, you know, it would, it would become proper cement blocks and the whole ship would sink. So they had to go right back. Uh, and the two governments suddenly realized that, look, this does not make any sense. You know, we wanted the cement, we paid for the cement, or we paid the advances. They sent us the cement and then it just stands in the harbor waiting for government clearances to go through. Uh, so the solution they came up with was actually quite funny because uh, the Indian <coughs> trademark sign is of course ISI and um, so they, they worked out a deal by which Indian officials would go to the Pakistani port and certify the goods that were coming in so that they would not have to wait in the harbor. So I, I used to joke that now we have uh, ISI marked goods coming from Pakistan to India and we're actually accepting them and welcoming them. So that's, that's really the, the synergy between business and government has to be tighter. If, if, if businessmen ask for it, if businessmen push for it, I think the governments will feel you know, empowered in a sense to just go ahead and make those very tough decisions because some of it means a financial loss, some of it means giving up monopolies inside your own countries. Um, but the greater good is there for all to see. I mean, as I said, if you just were to take down the amount of indirect trade, you know, the gentleman spoke about how he had to fly via Dubai. But think about all the goods that fly via Dubai when they go to various parts of the uh, uh, South Asian region. Just in terms of that, in terms of the logistics, we would save billions of dollars. In the light of uh, Indo-Pak differences, you in the capacity of an experienced uh, journalist, if you are asked to do a sort analysis of the region, how would you go about explaining that to us? In, in, in what way? In what sort of analysis? Uh, sort analysis of the region vis-a-vis -vis the emerging uh, giant economy in Asia, which is China. Thank you. Um, thank you. Would it be possible to move this just a <laughs> Ducking around it. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> the truth is, as I said, uh, is with the exception of Bhutan, each of the South countries are now dealing more with China than they are with the rest of the region. In fact, in some cases, with the rest of the region combined. Uh, and that's something for us to think about. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily a question of uh, a security threat. It's not necessarily a question of a threat to the region. But it's something for us to understand that people have found it easier uh, to, to deal with China and, and uh, despite China's large uh, uh, space on the, on the international scene. The truth is that South Asia is a part of Asia. We can't get away from the fact that China is a leader of Asia. But eventually in that is also based the idea that if we were actually together, if we were actually able to forge some kind of South Asian unity, then our leverage vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the Asian powers, because they have outstripped us. I mean, we, we can look at the figures in any way. And the fact is that South Asia lags behind the rest of it, uh, Asia when it comes to human indices, when it comes to trade, when it comes to um, uh, just the quality of life 
uh, in, any of, uh, in any of these regions. We are the poorest part of it. And um, if, if we were to actually get together, we would be able to leverage a lot more for our region as a result of that. Uh, do I think, uh, in a sense, that that, uh, that China's growing uh, growing space in the region is a cause for concern? Look, I, I wrote years ago that that there is again, you know, I come back to the common sense question. When you travel in this region, you know for a fact that India and the other countries in in the region have a lot more in common with each other. We just we have food in common. Uh, we have parts of our language in common with each other. We uh, we have humor in common. You know, a lot of the times I will I will understand the uh, sitcom in another country even if I don't understand the language because we have the same humor. We have a shared history. We have a shared feeling, knowledge of ourselves. Um, we have faith. The religions of South, South Asia are really steeped. I mean, our culture is steeped in the faith of South Asia in so many ways. If you go across uh, to the Maldives on one side uh, and Bangladesh on the other. So I always feel that the only fear we have of this encirclement that we continually worry, worry about is really a fear that we are not able to get together, that we are not able to understand it and somebody else can come. In terms of uh, you know what they call the string of pearls, the idea that China is interested in encircling uh, the region in a sense. I could say any re leader of the world, I mean why just China? The United States has similar interests in this region. Anyone can come and try and set up uh, a, a sort of uh, base for itself uh, on the peripheries of our region. But if South Asia was able to forge ahead, and I agree with Mam here when she said that India must take a leadership role in this, uh, then it wouldn't matter. We would each of us want the best for the other. And so if that means getting, uh, get, you know, getting a contract or getting a project that, uh, that we're getting with, a, with another country, that should be absolutely fine. But until we work this relationship out, my contention is we can't be happy. You know, India has for years cut itself off on both sides. It wasn't just Pakistan, it was Bangladesh as well. You know, it was almost like we were armless that we would deal with countries to the extreme left and the extreme right, but we wouldn't deal with the countries right on our borders. It hasn't helped us. And, and it's unlikely to have uh, any kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's not a policy that is likely to have any kind of success in the future as well. So we have to work it out. You know, it sounds almost filmy to say it, but it's like watching uh, uh, some sort of a serial about a family. And you know, you have all these siblings, you have the big brother, the next one, the next one, the next one. They have relationships. There's an uncle who will maybe speak to one child more than the other. Uh, eventually, we do have to understand that there is a fraternal bond between all of us. And, and I don't mean this in any kind of filmy style. I mean it genuinely because I've traveled through the region and I, and I can see that the, the similarities between us are much stronger than our differences. Sometimes when we look at the similarities, uh, and you know, one of the, the, great, uh, uh, the great things about going to the SAR summit is when you see these eight countries together, and I'm so glad Afghanistan is now a part of it, um, when you see these eight countries together, you realize that really our differences are, are small compared to all that we have uh, shared and in common. And if somebody, if, if another country is able to forge a relationship, then that's a, that's a failure for the whole uh, region as it were. I mean, I often am told I, I sound like Alice in Wonderland when I speak about South Asia because, you know, what has not happened in 30 years might not happen. But I know for a fact, and you're just going by the kind of comments that people have made this evening, you know for a fact that if the paperwork and the visas and the physical aspect of movement in this region were taken out of the way, you would find a real interest, a genuine interest amongst everyone here to travel, to go and see uh, what it's like, and to forge those relationships in the region. I, I, I don't think South Asian unity, uh, in that sense, is a is a wonderland concept. I think it's a very real concept if we, we are to achieve it. And I, I definitely don't think it'll, it'll take more than one generation to change that. Yes, ma'am.
Uh, firstly, I, I would like to commend you, commend you for your uh, wonderful career that you have behind. Uh, the question that I have is, uh, although we talk about bigger things of uh, Pakistan-India tensions and so many other political differences, I want to come to the very basics because uh, you were showing about this uh, SAFC uh, integration uh, very low uh, within the SAFC region. So I was just wondering uh, because uh, in terms of providing services when you do things, when you want to trade with, uh, among the SAFC countries, when you want to travel out, when you want to send your children for uh, education or health, whatever, what do you think about the the kind of service and the efficiency of the services that we, we give and also the ease of doing things, ease of getting things around. Uh, sometimes uh, within the SAC region I feel these are some of the fundamental problems that we have because uh, I know some of my friends they say, you know, oh I have uh, taken my ch ch uh, kids to be admitted into some of the regional uh, uh, countries among the SAC but the admission was so cumbersome and so bureaucratic I had to take the child out and put it in US or somewhere, you know. So all these bureaucratic procedures and also along with it, a lot of corruption uh, involved. So all these things also matter, uh, I believe, although we talk about bigger things, but at the end of the day, these are the things that also matters for people to people doing business, getting things around that you're able to do and get the services in an efficient manner, uh, in a uh, in a way that you want, uh, want. So, are we doing well in that uh, in the South regions as a whole? Are we uh, getting the best of things, best of the services, the quality that we want? Now, people want more and more convenient things, more cost-effective things. Are we doing well? So this is my question. Thank you so much, Bhaman. Uh, I am I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that not only are we so similar, that we are also similar in our weaknesses in the region. So you know what we have in India, which is called the chalta hai attitude. Everything goes. Um, you know the the idea of corruption at so many different levels, unfortunately, does exist across the region. But you're absolutely right that eventually, if the South Asian concept has to work, it has to work because the average person has to be able to feel. If I if my child wants to become a doctor, they will not just go to the best medical school in my country. They will go to the best medical school in the region. And I can assure you, it will be, you know, uh, in, it, it will be, in a sense, the best because we know that it is the South Asian region that produces the best doctors around the world. It is the South Asian region that produces the best engineers around the world. So we know that the resource is there, but we haven't yet really tapped it. You're absolutely right that why should we think about going to the US or to Singapore when, in fact, all the resources will be here. It comes back to my... Uh, basic question and I don't think we're doing very well in that regard. As I said, to begin with, it is, a, it is a mindset that we have created. We all deal with each other as boundaries. We deal with each other as a physical concept in uh, and what we have learned in school. Most people would be surprised to know that there is a, uh, that, you know, that there is a land uh, uh, boundary even between India, India and Bhutan. Um, I don't know if you were aware, but there was an interesting project that they started from Bangladesh, where three ambassadors from Bangladesh and one Bangladeshi uh, official drove from Bangladesh through India to Bhutan. They were just in uh, Vichling a few days ago, and then have gone on to Nepal to show that physically we can do this. But the truth is we don't know that physically we can do this because we've gotten used to the idea of only seeing um, seeing the region from our textbooks. And our textbooks are just lines, you know, they're just lines on a map that actually shouldn't mean that much. Um, I think education, as you pointed out, is one of the key ways to go forward. Um, the South Asian University concept, uh, I was myself a little disappointed in the first few years because we realized how little it had moved. Uh, but I, I understand, I've been speaking to the people there that over the years, it has grown in an idea. And last year, they got 4,600 applications. And at least half were from outside India. I think that's a growth. It's a very small figure. Uh, and until they are able to build the full campus, they can only offer 250 seats for that. Uh, but the concept has grown. And people are now coming from other countries. 
uh, to, to, live in this, uh, to live and study in this university that is now seen as a South Asian concept. We need more and more such things. We need the South Asian university. We need the idea of a South Asian currency. Uh, we need the idea of uh, the medias of all the countries being able to meet each other. The truth is, we don't actually know how small that figure is. You know, when it comes to the media, uh, we don't have that many correspondents posted in each other's capital. Whether they're of our country or of the other country, we just don't have those linkages. But the internet has changed that in so many ways, whether it's online education, whether it's online journalism. I think you are going to see a, a shift. And, and, and once countries open up, as I said, the trade sector, open up the banking, uh, you will see much more of, uh, uh, much less of the kind of red tape you spoke about when it comes uh, to education. But I think the concept of what you were saying there is very powerful. That eventually this entire region of 1.6 billion has to work on the idea that we are helping out the ordinary person, the common man in each of these countries. If, if it doesn't help them, if they're not able to get a better value for their produce, if they're not able to um, uh, use their bank in another country, if they're not even able to make a telephone call in one of the other countries of the South Asian region, uh, and if they don't see it as a viable option for their children to go and get an education in, then what is the value of this entire large concept of South Asian unity? So thank you, thank you for making that point. I think we have time for one more question if there is... Ah, oh, there are two more. Um, good evening, I'm Chiwang from Gita College. And, uh, to give my nutshell, uh, sub, uh, I mean, to give my subjective nutshell of your talk, um, it seems that the uh, political differences between the government and uh, the uh, social stereotypes uh, perceived by the other countries' people, and also the religion and cultural differences, seem to partially hinder uh, the success of this talk. So my question is. As being an experienced journalist, how are you fighting to culminate these differences? Because as journalists, uh, uh, it's part, uh, usually perceived as uh, rationally uh, you know, analyzed what is being said and revealed to the public. You know, so thank you. Thank you. Um, firstly, I think the differences that we have, except for the political differences you mentioned, really don't add up to much because each of our regions, if you look at any one of our countries, including in Bhutan, no matter how small, we're also proud of our culture, our faith, uh, or our sense of the way we dress. That when you travel across South Asia, actually you see much more color, you see much more of an interest in people's own traditions than perhaps in, in any other re region where a lot has got standardized, where a lot has got uh, uh, you know, westernized in a sense. Uh, so I do think that the differences are what make us different. Uh, the fact that we have all of these differences between us. What can we as journalists do? Uh, I think the gentleman before you asked a similar question and I always try to shy away from that because I feel that if as a journalist I start to talk about peace, you know, we have uh, an Indian phrase that says if a, if a horse makes friends with the grass, what will it eat? So if a journalist makes friends with the concept and becomes a, a, a votary for peace, uh, what, what will we report on? Because we are also good at reporting on conflict. But the truth is, it's a, it's a larger cause than all of us. And I think what journalists can do, if they are allowed to do it, is really to open the windows between all our countries. We are not able to open the doors because the doors are carefully manned by the governments of all these regions with their big armies and all their visa restrictions and all the political problems they have. So we can't open doors between the countries. But we can open windows and we can allow people to see the other side. And if we do that well, I think we, we will have established a certain understanding between the countries of the region which they don't have right now. Um, we will be able to see that people look at themselves as citizens of South Asia. That's a concept we haven't yet worked on. It's a concept that even all the SARC summits we've had, uh, which is why they are called talk, talk shops, as uh, 
uh, as the gentleman here said, um, is because that concept of being a citizen of South Asia is not something we have owned up to yet. But I think if journalists can do that, if journalists can talk about that idea and, as I said, open these windows to each other, then the rest will be taken care of. I don't know if that completely answers your question, um, but, but I hope what, I, what I'm saying does, uh, does get through that journalists can only be a catalyst for a movement that already uh, has a certain basis and already is getting a certain amount of encouragement from the rest of society. And the lady there had a question as well. Should we make this the last question or are there any other? Oh, there are. We begin as we end. But sir, uh, the lady before you is going to This is the two last questions. Uh, good evening, ma'am, and thank you very much for this opportunity. The Indo Pak conflict has gone on for too long. And every time tensions mount between the Indo Pak uh, LOC, we worry a lot. And we tend to follow the news very closely. And we see, very sadly, lots of lives, precious lives lost and a lot of resources wasted. There are times when we just want to throw our, throw up our hands in the air and say, you know, why can't the leaders of these two nations for once sit face to face and talk about things and resolve the issues? But of course, that is much more easier than done. What I would be interested to know from you, ma'am, is not as an Indian, but as a journalist who has traveled the length and breadth of the region and also as a global citizen, uh, which country has or should have taken much more initiatives than it has done to resolve the conflict, and also which country has shied away or refused to cooperate with the initiatives taken by the other country with some examples. Thank you very much. Uh, you put me in a tough position. <laughs> but uh, the truth is, to the first part of what you said, while I have sounded extremely critical of the fact that the governments have not done enough to uh, resolve the conflicts between them. Uh, India and Pakistan took one very important step in 2003, and that was the ceasefire along the line of control. While we remain concerned about the ceasefire violations on that line of control, that ceasefire has now lasted more than 10 years. And I know that in our media, because we have very young people as journalists, and many of them have not, don't really remember the old times, uh, they tend to speak about it as if you know, war is around the corner and these ceasefire violations. We've never seen anything like this before in unprecedented tensions between the two countries. You know, before 2003, close to 500 soldiers on an average would die because of LOC firing. When we look at the figures today, they've come steadily down to the point where we talk about 12, uh, between 12 and 20. Those are still 12 and 20 too many. We should not lose any of our soldiers on, uh, on that uh, line of control between the two countries. But the truth is that it has changed and it has made a dramatic difference uh, to the people there. Um, years ago, it was Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif who said to me, don't you think it's uncivilized? So I was a little you know, taken aback by him using the word uncivilized. He think around the world. Can you think of any other border, any other frontier where soldiers stand, you know, barrel of the gun to barrel of the gun, eyeball to eyeball. You know, there's a check post on this side and there's a check post exactly on the other side and they spend the whole day sort of looking at each other. And I've seen the LOC from both sides, from the Indian side and the Pakistan side. And he said, don't you think it's uncivilized? Even when we speak about parallels, what would we say? We would say the TMZ between North and South Korea. But the truth is that the TMZ doesn't have this kind of you know, eyeball to eyeball confrontation. They've built enough, uh, enough of a militarized zone between the two countries to avoid that. Um, because really, the loss of even one life is just one life too many. Uh, years ago, I went across the LOC uh, in Pakistan and I uh, asked one of the district magistrates what the ceasefire had meant. And uh, he showed me that of 20 four blocks, I think, that were along the LOC, 19 of those blocks had been able to build schools simply because there was a ceasefire. Think about the power of what that meant. 
that the children of those villages along the LOC were no longer needing to go, you know, 40, 50 kilometers to get to school every day. Um, they were actually seeing schools being built in those regions. On the Indian side, farmers repopulated their villages after some 20 years. They were able to tend their crops because uh, they'd been mined and they had to be demined over time. Um, so the, 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 the benefits of that ceasefire are there for everyone to see. It's sad that they're not evident enough so that we are able to stop the ceasefire violations, stop the firing altogether. But I would be, uh, I would be unfair to our governments if I was to say they had not done something about that. Um, when, you, when you speak about the idea of which side has been more unfair, I think both sides are guilty of one thing. You know, years ago, uh, there was there, there's someone called Abba Iban, who, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he was an Israeli negotiator who was in charge of a lot of the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. And he one day in an interview said, you know, the problem with us, and in fact he was speaking about the other side, is that they never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. And I think that's what they're the most guilty of. There have been so many occasions, and I've been covering this conflict for 20 years. Uh, so you can imagine the kind of frustration that, that sometimes I feel when I hear these things. There have been so many occasions where a leader or a, an official has said to me, you know, these elections, let these elections get over and then, you know, we'll have talks. Or let something else happen and we'll be able to do this. Let's just deal with this internal situation and after that, we'll sign the agreement. The fact is that when those opportunities have emerged, for a conflict resolution, they have missed those opportunities. And that is really the worst side. Has one side been more guilty than another? I, I definitely feel that they have been guilty of not understanding the other side's point of view. Uh, in that, I will make the point, and I, and I made it over here as well, that, that Pakistan has failed to understand the immense hurt uh, that people in India feel over terrorism, and particularly over the Mumbai attacks. If there was a missed opportunity, it was that. Because if you remember, close to 24 to 36 hours after the attacks, the two leaders actually were able to speak. And they spoke about a joint uh, investigation. They spoke about taking that process forward. I think had they been able to forge that, and had uh, a, the full process of justice been done on the Pakistani side, a lot would have changed on the Indian side as well. But is that to mean that India has not been guilty of missing opportunities? I don't think that's true either. There have been times. There have been times when, uh, when an opportunity has been missed very openly. Uh, President Musharraf did at one point, in fact, in an interview say that had I not had internal problems, I was willing to go ahead on the, on the resolution of uh, Kashmir. And Prime Minister Manmohan Singh said it very clearly to me once in an interview in 2009. He said, we came very close to a non-territorial non-border solution. Uh, and of course, then internal problems in Pakistan meant that they didn't happen. So there have been these opportunities along the way. And I think that all leaders must understand that they don't have time on their side. Because be between now and that goal of whenever they think that they can forge an, uh, a resolution, there will always be a third party whose entire interest is in not having India and Pakistan come together. We know that there are there are groups like that who just want to see, the, who live off the idea that India and Pakistan will be at war. And they will, they will take the opportunities that our leaders are missing in that regard. So I certainly hope that they do hear uh, your voice as well. And um, I, I'd just like to thank you all. You've been such a wonderful audience this evening. And you've come up, if you ask me, with more ideas. Uh, on the subject of discussion today than, than I have walked in here with. So a round of applause if you like for all of you here tonight. Thanks so much.